Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are, welcome. My name is Sharon Little. I am a Music for People grad, and we are talking today, I'm talking today with Jim Oshinsky. Um, and we've got a Music for People, like our, our flagship workshop coming up. Usually we're online. This year, again, we're, uh, you, sorry, we usually we're live. <laughs> Hasn't life changed? Usually we're live this year, again, we're online. And Jim Oshinsky is one of the presenters. Not only that, but Jim is a dear friend and we've been connected, my goodness, for 30 years or so. Jim goes back beyond that. He is one really OG and he has been one of the people, kind of a through line in the history and archiving um, of what goes on in MFP. He's, and one of the, his great gifts that he has offered is just his capacity to you know, follow, he followed David around and he was able to observe and, and transform his observations into really clear words. And he's come out with two with our, you know, it was wonderful, Return to Child book. And uh, most recently, a whole set of cards based on that, on the Music for People techniques. And he's going to be presenting that at Art of Improvisation, August 1st to 3rd. Jim, welcome. This is, I think I got it all. <laughs> Yeah. Thank and you. so can you let's go back to uh, return to child and just say something about how that came about, because we kind of take it for granted. Right. It was it, it was clear from the very beginning in watching David teach and in watching other people start to teach some of the same techniques that David was modeling, that this material was tremendously valuable for music education and music therapy and music performance. That um, the, the fact that these were games that unfolded differently each time uh, and weren't codified in, uh, people weren't constricted in what they were to play, but just, they were just given things to pay attention to internally and externally. You know, what to focus in your own playing and what to focus, especially in the playing of your partners to make improvisations work. This was not something that seemed to exist elsewhere. Uh, uh, there is plenty of approaches to improvisation that uh, have a great history and literature, but they're very much sort of m mentally forward you know there it's about scales and modes and doing a very elaborate dance in a small box and free improvisation uh, whether it came from you know a, a jazz or an avant-garde or a classical you know point point of view uh free improvisation threw the box away but what david did was to say this was not for elite performers this was for everybody this was a way of making music accessible to all combinations of people. So the freedom took improvisation out of its position as the last skill in the sequence of instruction and put it at the head of the class, so to speak, as the first skill. And in some ways, the only skill you need to be able to interact musically with people from different levels of experience, different levels of ability, different cultures. Um, so it was it was inclusive and brilliant, and kind and and in you know it. So that was you know certainly what drew me to it when I you know when I saw his his approach. But initially, if you hadn't, it was one of those things where you had to be there, because. Uh, there was anecdotal talk of the content of the workshops, but there wasn't anything preserving what the activities were, or even more importantly, how they were presented. Because you could take a um, music for people type activity, and if you twisted it enough, you could present it in a really horrible way. <laughs> uh, or a very constricted and judgmental way, which would really be, you know, just counterproductive to the whole idea so if the what and the how were equally important and so that in return to child became the dual emphasis on musicianship and leadership like what the activities were and how to present them because the philosophy of both were the same 
um, that leadership was improvisation, that the generosity of listening, um, the, I'm going to have to dismiss this phone call. Hang on just a second. Sorry. Uh, yeah, if I don't take it, it's just going to answer and we'll have to deal with that. So sorry about that. And so we're okay. improvising. So it's just starting to pour rain here. We may have thunderstorms. Jim's getting phone calls because he just has to be connected. Um, before you go on, I want to go back to uh, the actual underlying principle of, of free improv because we're talking to a lot of teachers and having been in the classroom as a music teacher or people in music theory, you know, improvisation has typically and fundamentally come been seen as jazz improvisation. That is where, uh, that's where what the immediate association, if I'm going to improvise, it's jazz improvisation. And how do I do jazz improvisation? And we start turning ourselves inside and then you're talking about all the scales and I, my jazz musician friends, you know, know there are scales and their modes and inside out backwards and upside down and they play from a lead sheet. And if they are playing free on prov, it's still a whole other animal because it's st often I hear still is a bit of a, can be a mental game. And the jazz musicians who have come into my workshops, have, you know, taking this other approach have gone, oh, this is completely different. And so, and I think the other thing that's, that I have loved with this work is that we can take a jazz, uh, like the blues form, we can take a blues scale, we can take that as a guide, but as you're saying, like the underlying piece is that there's no lead sheets, there's no wrong notes, but that it is compassion based and, wel uh, it, and, wel and welcoming of all styles, because no matter what you, I mean, you describe something like blues, but the actual scales that are used in different forms of blues are all these different are, are, are very, very different depending on whether it's Chicago or Southern or, you know, uh, or ragtime, you know, influenced. So which one is the center? Well, none of them are the center. You know, this is the rope where no fiber runs the whole length. Um, uh, and so what are you left with? You know, uh, what, what you're left with is the moment and responding um, sensitively to the moment. Uh, whether, and it's gonna be recognized, because people bring their, their personal histories to the moment of improvisation. And that personal history includes all of the different styles that have influenced them and whatever's moving in them emotionally at the moment, you know, at that moment. And sometimes what's moving emotionally, that authenticity is all you really need. And everything else is just, you know, trying to be an expression of that emotional truth. If you can get to that emotional truth directly, then throw everything else away because that's what connects us human to human. Uh, and that's also where the music therapy aspect of this sometimes comes in because music therapists have that as their goal some of the time, you know, is to just get authentic emotional expression in sound. And um, when I first saw some of uh, this work, that's as my training is in parallel as a musician and a psychologist. And when I saw this work, I said, this is tremendously powerful music therapy uh, because all of the social emotional connections that people make by listening attentively, by taking turns, by supporting each other, by being strategically silent, uh, or at least monitoring their level of participation uh, so that they're not overly, you know, domineering and, and such. Um, all, of, all of this stuff, you get, it gets preachy to try to tell people how to do this. But if you can embody this in a way where they live the experience uh, in another uh, domain, like music, now they're practicing how to be good human beings. Um, and being good human beings together makes for good music. 
in fact, it makes for intensely artful music. Uh, when And hopefully it also uh, generalizes to situations when you're not playing music. Um, and, it, and it could make you a, a better listener in general, um, more willing to make your own personal statements honestly and, and uh, strongly, uh, to, to let your voice be heard, so to speak. You know, all of those metaphors are really good for life as well as for musical interactions. I'm just going to mute as the rain comes in because I know I know this uh, picks up all the birds and rain sounds. Uh, mm -hmm. So, as a music educator, a classroom teacher coming into this, I know having done that, you know, they could get the book, and and I, they really need. To, do you have it there? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You want to see? Go and get it. It uh, must be. I, I, yeah, I don't really have cool. to go far as long as my headphone cord yeah. will. Okay. Me. So they would. I mean, this book is such a tremendous resource. It uh, there are so many different activities. There it is. There it is. And so as you were, as people are coming in and taking this book, if they are not coming to a workshop, and this is really why we really encourage people to come to Art of Improvisation, because you come into this community that holds and supports and encourages and where there is no judgment, where we've all been through the judgment game. We've all done that. We've all recognized it. We're all in their varied phases of it, um, but coming in to this space, then taking the book back into the classroom is going, will give a whole other color to it, even though, I mean, you can still take the book and, yeah. I've, I've been doing this, you know, uh, since time began, apparently. Uh, but um, I am not able in any of these settings to approach music making or listening to other people's music with no judgment. Uh, I've, I've just not evolved that far myself. But what I've learned is to release the judgments that come up, you know, and just to notice them. And of course, helpfully through my psychology training, you know, we, I mean, that's what we call counter-transference. And we, you know, look at the judgments we make, where they come from, what our personal uh, influences are that lead us to judge that way and then not place that unfairly on other people. So, you know, but that, the, the, the release, that, that release gesture and just the act of letting, letting stuff go has been so tremendously powerful as, as a musical and life lesson. Um, you know, so we, how do we, how do we get to that place of no judgment? We get to that place through releasing. And there's a whole, we, we talk about uh, this work being mindfulness through music improvisation. And, mm -hmm. and there is that noticing, oh, I'm kind of judging that or my own stuff or, uh, you know, hearing something that sounds different and saying, well, there's, I don't like that. And then, okay, let that go. Um, it's, and being, being okay without, and, and being mindful and being noticing and, okay, how can I, now I can let that let go, realize that that's not really true, and I can sink in deeper. Right, and use everything as a mirror. You know, use use everything to say, all right, what does this say? What does this say about me? You know, if and I, then let if, that go, and then yeah. get on with it because we yeah, want, absolutely. really want to make music. You know, yeah. we, we can get in that loop and that yeah. loop. And now, now, what when when what we have is a book, right? No matter how, I mean. Even if the book were perfect, which it's which it's not, but even if the book were perfect, it's still a book, which means that people have to sit and read it and people have to digest it and then figure out how in the world am I going to take these things and implement them. Uh, and you, you read the leadership part and it says what mindset to approach leading with. But one thing that we definitely don't do is give a cookie cutter, uh, uh, you know, uh, rigid sequence of do this first, do this second, do this third, just because there's no freedom in that. And it may not be appropriate for the moment that comes next, even if it was appropriate for the moment when you saw someone else do it. You know, you just want to let your... So when someone wants to implement this, what can they do? It is not easy, you know, to figure out how to go from participating in the workshops to how would I 
work this into my classroom, right? How would I, how could I make this happen? So, and what we haven't had until now is a game, you know, is, is a, is a, a widget, you know, something that people can have and take with them and implement uh, with relatively simple instructions. And, and the, in this sense, like the product teaches the content and all you have to do is set up the use of the product. Okay, now, the, so now the setup, is, the, I mean, the setup, and I'm sorry, go ahead, Sharon. I'm just checking. Is my mic working here? Yeah. I've had issues. Okay. I, we've got a downpour here, so we, I'm just going to go in and out. <laughs> yeah, I'm, oh, not, I'm, not, I'm not noticing the, the extra sound much here, okay. so I think All you're right. good. All right. So that is... Um, that is a great segue. I'm just, so tell me, these are, these are the Dr. Music uh, cards. And I've watched this whole concept come through our Friday night grad session. Suddenly these lights started coming on. Before you get into the cards, can you just say, you know, okay, there wasn't a game. What was, what started okay. that creative so, process? Okay, so let's, let's start with uh, one of the core activities at Music for People, which is to have four people sit as a as an improvising quartet with a blank canvas of, of of time in front of them right so you have two to three minutes go right and you have four people sitting there so in a free improv setting they will find each other in the music they may breathe together first they may um launch into the improvisation in a whole bunch of different ways all of which are legitimate legitimate and will work but they could, you know, all do tremolo together and then have some sound come out of the tremolo. They may do a, decide to breathe and drone together and have the improvisation come out of the drone. Somebody may start a groove or a rhythm and other people could join in in layers. There are all sorts of different ways of starting. Um, but when, that, when if, they, if, once if, they, once the improvisation is rolling, there are all sorts of different ways of participating you can make strong solo statements. You can harmonize what you hear a partner do. You can interact conversationally. You can lay out and create contrast by being silent and be impactful when you come back in. There's all sorts of ways of participating. Yeah. But how do we, what, the, I'm listening to this as, okay, well, I've got well, a four, four, and I've done this with my kids at staff, put four mm -hmm. people in improvise and it's like oh yeah well so you need How obviously you, you need yeah. obviously these cards and then the cards. these cards are not the beginning right in other words you'd have to set up the the a couple of key uh improvisation skills before these cards as variations on those skills uh make the most sense you would have to help people figure out how to start you would have to give people a couple of ideas for how to participate and give people, uh, not surprisingly, a couple of ideas for how to end, you know? So you don't have a snowball that rolls endlessly down the infinite hill. Uh, you want there to be a, a stopping place. Um, but but if, you, if you teach just a few launching and connecting ideas, not very many, these will take care of all the rest of them. So once people know this is how we can begin, this is how we interact, then they become hungry for more ways of interacting and more ways of uh, starting and stopping. Okay, and so now, now you have an inventory right. in the cards of all these different ways that will expand on the basics. So what's in the cards? Show us the card deck, what happens? How do we do um, these? Well, what, what I did, what I did for many years was I, I have a I have a gizmo. Let me show you the gizmo. Okay, I love gizmos. I have, a, I have a widget and a gizmo. Widgets and gizmos. It's always good. All right, I've got I've got a gizmo. Okay, okay. and this gizmo oh goodness, has yeah. <laughs> this gizmo has four. Uh, it's high tech. You know, yeah, high -tech well, really high tech, right? High tech clothes it's, pins. It's got these four clothespins connected to a bent uh, clothes hanger right. where the bend includes this little circle in the center that happens to fit on a mic stand. 
<laughs> so that if you had four people sitting around, you could connect an index card to each one. And that's how I started with all of this. This is what I used to do in my classes. Uh -huh. So the index card might say for, um, it might say something that's basic to music for people improvising, like ostinato or groove, which means that somebody would provide more or less something like a repeated bass line. Okay. That's like the easiest way to uh, conceptualize that. But if, if you were sitting in a quartet and this thing was on a mic stand in front of the four of you, and your card, the one that was facing you, said ostinato, you'd know that at some point during this improvisation, you could take on the ostinato role. It doesn't mean that you're limited to that altogether, and that's the only thing you should do. It's one of but the it, tools you've got. But it's, it's, it's mindful, right? Yeah. It's emphasize this. You know, be, you know be, look for your opportunity to contribute that to this um, improvisation. And you so might have might done be... that anyway. You might yeah. have done that spontaneously, but but prompted by the card, okay. now it puts something else in mind for you. Yep. And we're back. <laughs> yeah, with with the with the widget. So originally, I did this with okay. index cards, right. and the index cards might have said "powerful solo," right. or "ostinato," or "drone," or some of the basic ways of participating in music for people style improvisations. Um, I, I might have had 15 or 20, you know, individual suggestions like that. Hmm. Um, might have included um, have a musical conversation. Right. Or it might have said things that are more abstract and challenging, right. like uh, get everybody to follow you. So you were so doing that, that for a while in your classes? In my, in my classes, right, because I teach uh, an improvisation class that goes for a full semester at a local university. And I have uh, music ed students and the rest of the university, anybody who wants to take the class. Right. Um, at those, that's my group. Okay. So, and so uh, then I can, you did that. And then what? Then I had the, the... well, I had this idea. I, I had a brainstorm one day saying, well, this, I've got, the brainstorm was to put this into four different categories. The four categories would be improvisation basics, yep. musical styles, uh, support roles, and the uses of space and contrast. Right. So now, once I had those four, you know, a four-way, then the idea of making this like a deck of cards just sort of jumped right in. Right. So as a deck of cards, now I had needed to get to 13 of each of those, plus two jokers. Perfect. Uh, and that's what I did. You know, I just sort of expanded those lists. The basics were easy to have yep. 13 things that included things like sing what you play and play what you sing. It, um, so drone and ostinato and conversation, and harmonizing, shadowing somebody, you know, doing exactly what they do. Yep. Uh, all of those are, are basics. So uh, support a, role. So you go a, ahead. A, the deck opened because I'd like, I'd just like to see this so we could have. Oh uh, yeah. Because this, this deck of cards, you've been kind of selling them out of your house lately, but they are now up on a website that people can order online. Okay. So if you, so I, one of our grads to have that card deck, uh, that's upside down. That's cool. There we, go. <laughs> <laughs> we have those moments too. So just keep putting some of those cards up, and I'll explain what Jonathan did. One of our grads had oh. a deck of cards, and he and a student took their instruments outside, and they each had um, the deck was in between them. And then they started improvising, and Jonathan would pick a card, invite everyone to get loud and move. So without telling his partner what he was going to do, he just did that. And the two of them went back and forth for five or ten minutes playing with them, and taking these cards as, okay, this is now what I'm doing. So it was a remarkable series of improvisations that he did. Okay, so what you would, with people in this group, if people have got four people, then you're gonna do some of this at AOI. Yeah, all right, so you're gonna um, have some of that, you don't wanna show everybody the whole thing. And oh, I don't, also, I, I don't have, mind, but I'll stop. <laughs> I know, it's so exciting to see this project, you know, this little baby. Well, 
but that's like, that's the face of the cards. Right. Now, if this were a normal, if this were a normal deck of cards, all the backs would be the same. Right. But, but that no. seemed like a, that seemed like a wasted opportunity. Yeah. Uh, in other words, if we're going to ha- print the backs of the cards, why not print something different on each back so that the cards could also be used to uh, set moods? And the mood could be the subject for the improvisation. So you could have, you know, this as a, Look. you know, play the soundtrack to that. Right. Or this. Something a little more oh, fantastic. Wow. Uh-huh. Or something like this. Right. Um, so that could so, be... That would be a, a um, it's like a, a music prompt, like a writing prompt, but an yes, improv prompt. Exactly. So there are ways of participating on the verbal side, and there are evocative cards that suggest different moods on the reverse side. And so it's it's like two decks in one. Yeah, exactly. But, but once I had that idea, putting it together, you know, I mean, I, I created a couple of prototypes and tried them out with my class. Uh, and the class just said, this is really cool. So we just kept going with the development of it. And honestly, within a month, there was a, a product to um, promote. Yeah, it, it moved uh, really I, I, found a print, I found a printer who prints flashcards. Yep. Um, and I decided to make you know, a relatively small investment in getting this off the ground. I mean, all of this came together for less than $500 as an investment, which uh, is, is just not a lot for a product. No. And then creating the um, creating a, a booklet that was 32 pages and mentions each of the cards and tells teachers the overall yeah. philosophy of what these cards could emphasize in a in a music ed setting and in an improv i'm just because you know when you see some of those cards it can be okay you know and and unless you've got some kind of context for it it could not be you know it wouldn't be a beginner thing to throw up no right throw this up with no just give them out to your kids you know and see what happens and no no exactly and in fact what i would suggest that that people do is introduce the cards gradually this is the library but you don't take every book out of the library all at once right you basically take out three or four and then introduce you know one or two more and that way you'll eventually get to all of this and if you did you you'd have a i mean but if you introduced all of the concepts in here you would have a relatively comprehensive class in group improvisation Uh, but it might take us but it might take a semester to do yeah. that or if you did it once a week you could do it once a week for a year yeah this is not something where you're gonna uh, unload all of this at once no because and I'm thinking it was younger with uh, you know grade four three four five grade one two three up to eight like elementary school kids you you know take out a couple and 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 it's like pulling out let's and teachers do that anyway they're not going to use the whole thing so we yeah. had we had games we had I remember having um, counseling games that I would play when I worked as a school psychologist. Yep. And there I had to preview the cards in some of these games and pull out some of them sure, that were not appropriate for the population I was working with. Yeah, exactly. Or, you know, so you do the same thing here, you know, just to be able to pick and choose based on what you want to teach and what your uh, students are in a position to take in. Okay, so with with uh, we, we're still working out all the details for the session you're going to attempt to offer, depending on who can be around. But it, well, ide- ideally, this would be done live. I yeah, mean, exactly. obviously, and so I was hoping do- I'm still hoping to put together a pod, so to speak, mm-hmm. of live musicians at my home where we could be sitting, you know, a little further back from the camera here in this room in a quartet with a microphone stand in, in the middle of us with this gizmo on it and one of the cards from the deck in front of each of us. Yeah. And then we would play and then we might be able to guess who had which card and what role yeah. they were being asked to fulfill. Or in the middle, we might rotate this so the role for the people would change. 
And so for people coming to AOI, um, they would, they would, they could do it on, you know, they could, you could probably put a card up for well, them. I mean, yeah, it's well, we do it the same little... way we did for the grad set. Yeah. Grad session. In other words, what I was hoping to do was to demonstrate it and yeah. then basically have an online breakout experience where we oh, could we divide the, the participants into quartets yeah. and using the chat function of, um, of Zoom, I could private message a card content to right. each person in a quartet. Right. So it uh, takes a little bit more elaborate setup to make it work but we've made it work before, so exactly. it can work. This can work online. This is awesome. Um, yeah, I just had a fly go by my camera. I, I saw. Little... <laughs> I saw it looked, at this at that side, that close to the camera, it looked that like a, a locust. <laughs> That's huge. Okay, well, that I mean, I wanted to get the whole return to child and the the cards there because that's really um, some concrete MFP product that we've been able to put out and it's now available where what is the website we'll put it also in uh, sure comments the, and well can, it had exactly went up publicized it just went up today right it's well yes although there's probably a, a more a, a different phrase for it um i'm still the publisher of this thing you know i um, it's a self-published right pro product i didn't uh, sign anything away to make this happen but i've got a distributor okay. which is a west music Okay. is the distributor and West Music is one of the largest uh, catalog companies that uh, sells all sorts of uh, educational materials from sheet right. music to band instruments to uh, live music therapy services. They are a, a, a pretty big operation okay. and it was through contacts through Music for People that I got in okay. touch with the head uh, of marketing at West Music, and more or less, as soon as they saw this thing, they said, uh, "Yeah, um, we don't have anything like this, no. and this is, uh, you know, high quality enough that we would want it." And they, uh, you know, placed a, you know, a sizable order. seed order to get their inventory started, and uh, then worked on uh, whatever graphics they needed to do to put it on the web. It right. went on the web yesterday. So uh, West yeah. West Music West Music dot com. Okay, so um, everybody that's listening is going to go and get themselves a set of cards. Um, Yay! Yeah, and uh, because teachers love having sets of cards because it gives them something to do. And Return to Child, where is that? And it available? and it comes in this convenient oh, carry case. There you go. You can just as because uh, we know some of you are itinerant and you just put it on that music cart and truck it on to the next place. And and Return to Child, where is that available? Uh, Return to Child is available through the Music for People office still at this okay. point, uh, uh, musicforpeople.org. And it's also available in PDF. Are you still doing that? Is yeah. Uh, hard yes. copy and PDF? Okay. Um, absolutely. Okay. Actually, for both. If people contact me and they have a need for a PDF version of the cards, um, okay. you know, that's that's a possibility. We'll get that uh, information onto, but, onto the but video. But this is available... As a download, it's available yeah. as a um, in PDF form on a disc, although yeah. no computers have disc readers anymore. No, I would suggest, I mean, really, the book is the way to go on this. We all know what happens to those PDFs we download, right? They get lost in some download folder somewhere. The book is really great. You pull it out. So, um, Jim, thank you very much. I hope that we'll, have, we'll get a chance to see the cards in action at AOI, Art of Improvisation. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, any last, any last, last words before we sign off here about music uh, for people, about the benefits, about life? <laughs> yeah, I, I, for many years, and, and, uh, I listened to an NPR show called Car Talk and Car Talk was the, these two guys from, uh, the Boston area who were both car repair people and, uh, uh, engineers and philosophers. So mm -hmm. they talked about things, you know, far and wide beyond uh, why is my car making this, you know, gurgling noise. But they always talked about, um, uh, in their humorous way, the, the third half of their show. Uh, and, uh, and so um, Return to Child has, uh, has uh, half of it is about musicianship 
half is it about, uh, is about leadership and half is about connecting this with um, other ways of uh, introducing music like okay. drum circles or awesome. like uh, how to use this in um, in classrooms. Um, I'll, I'll give you one one particular example that, sure. that comes up a lot. Um, we do call and response a lot as an activity just to get people warmed up and to introduce the idea of imitation. Um, and sometimes if we're savvy, we can embed the content that we want to teach in the call and response. Sure. So instead of the call and response being sort of random things, if we wanted to teach major and minor, we could do call and response and sing a major melody and then sing the same melody minor, have it come back to us. And now the people have experienced it. You know, so call and response is a really powerful technique for experiential education. But as so what I would always encourage teachers to do is to embed in call and response the most of the things they want the students to pay attention to the most, including things like what pages are the homework? You know, you just have to be a little clever with your rapping, you know, for for how you deliver those those lines in rhythm so that the students could give them back to you in rhythm. And that's that's my parting, you know, sort of little sample gift here. And so really, I mean, teachers have been doing that kind of stuff, which tells me and tells us and whoever is listening that this is accessible to anybody. It's not it's not a foreign kind of language. No, it's I, not, worked, uh, I worked I worked I worked in a an in an elementary school for 25 years. And I saw almost every teacher do stuff like this. And had everybody clap back as a way of doing what drum circle people would call almost an attention call. That that it was uh, the cue that something important was going to come next. And then they stopped the rhythm and started talking. And they lost a third of the class who basically tunes out to the drone of talking. And they might not have lost those people if they, they kept the content talk. in the rhythm. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Well, Jim, thank you so much for your time. I know you're, uh, you are busy. This is, I know we squeezed in between. Yeah, I apologize for the phone calls, but I'm that's, sitting at my desk. That's okay. And phone so calls are going to come in. Hey, I've yep. had, it's all right. We're that's, this is what it is. And, and this is like an improvisation, right? We take whatever is coming in and, and it becomes part of whatever we are doing and we don't yep. freak out about it. We, you know, oh, there it is, there it is, there it is. We observe and yep. off we go on. Absolutely. So, it, 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 I'm glad it was the phone and not the dog. Well, well, you know, dogs, you know, we've had dogs and cats in our improvs, you know. We, we have, but it would have been... a. <laughs> I just would have been less available if the dog was here. <laughs> okay. So for everyone watching, Art of Improvisation is August 1, 2, and 3. It is online, and it's set up in ways that we know you've, you've, people have been online a lot. Um, so it's set up, you know, there may be some that you really absolutely, there are three parts to some of them. There are one part. Uh, there is an early bird registration that is happening now until July 16th. So we encourage you to get on. We'd like to make it accessible. You'll meet an extraordinary community. I've been in this community since the early 90s was my first thing. And I hmm. went into the program in 96, graduated in 2000. I am still here hmm. 20 years later, and I would not be anywhere else. We welcome you all, hmm. uh, any instrument, any level experience, a friend, whatever you want to do. Thank you, Jim. We will see you on August 1st. And, yeah, and, um, and thank you, Sharon, for the way that you anchor so many important things for music oh, for people and, and, and hold it together with uh, uh, a, a good heart and a good brain. Well, thank you. That's very, very kind. Thank you very much. And we'll see you all later. Bye. <laughs>